Assembly Committee on Government Affairs will come to order. Madam Secretary, please call roll. Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Black. Here. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Ellison. Present. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblyman Matthews. Here. Assemblyman MacArthur. Here. Assemblywoman Th Thomas. Here. Assemblywoman Torres. Here. Chair Flores. Here. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please let the record reflect all members are present. We have a quorum. Good morning, members. Uh, happy Friday to you all. Um, today, uh, as you all know, we have one bill on the agenda, and then we'll follow it with public comment. I want to remind those of you uh, joining us virtually this morning. First of all, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to your committee. Uh, as always, I want to remind you, uh, please don't take it as a sign of disrespect if you see members looking in multiple directions. Um, that's typically because they have multiple monitors and are either looking at paperwork or something uh, related to what we're talking about. Uh, members, please keep your microphone on mute unless you are speaking, and please keep your camera on at all times unless uh, you have something. Uh, obviously, turn it off and just give me a quick heads up so we understand what's happening. Uh, with that, uh, we have our very own uh, uh, chair of our education committee, Assemblywoman Bilbrey Axelrod, joining us this morning alongside of Mr. Felipe Ortiz. Uh, Mr. Ortiz, it's great seeing you. Uh, great to have you in your committee. I don't know that we've ever had an opportunity to have you here. Uh, this, I don't think this is the first time we've had you this session, so welcome. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and open up the, the hearing on Assembly Bill 258. Good morning and welcome to both of you. Thank you, Chair Flores, Vice Chair Torres, uh, members of the hardworking Committee on Government Affairs. For the record, I am Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray Axrod, representing Assembly District 34 within Clark County, and I'm here to present Assembly Bill 258 for your consideration. I had the distinct pleasure of serving on the Las Vegas Clark County Library District Board of Trustees for over 10 years until my term just expired in February of this year. During that time, I took part in the hiring process of two executive directors, as well as our most recent Director of Human Resources. The Las Vegas Clark County Li Library District is the 11th largest library district in the nation with 16 urban branches and nine rural branches. The 2021 operating budget for the Las Vegas Clark County Library District, commonly referred to LVCCLD, is over $70 million. The district serves 1.7 million people over 8,000 square miles, larger than the state of Connecticut. Many of the branches have art galleries as well as performing arts centers. As the Las Vegas Clark County Library District has grown exponentially over the years, unique needs and challenges have come and the Nevada revised statute and corresponding NAC codes uh, need to reflect those changes. The executive director manages so much more than library operations. Their duties include supervision of HR, IT, finance, legal issues, marketing, development, planning, facilities, community engagement, and that's just to name a few. Assembly Bill 258 does two main things for the Consolidated Library District that serves over 1 million people, which is Clark County, Las Vegas Library. The bill number one gives the LVCCLD board the authority to establish educational qualifications that include, but are not limited to a master of library and information science, commonly referred to an MLIS. And it gives the board the authority to hire an internal auditor. I did want to point out that over a hundred of the district's current employees do have their MLIS, but by allowing the board to consider qualifications other than just exclusively an MLIS, the board has more of an option to find the ideal candidate. The library district is also asking for the authority to hire an internal auditor. Given the size and growth of the library district, this is something that the board has needed 
to contract out and would appreciate the ability to hire someone to do this internally. I want to emphasize that this legislation does not impact libraries run by Nevada cities or counties, and this legislation is permissive, not instructive. Board of Library Districts should be given the tools to set up education qualifications and staffing decisions that they find appropriate to their organization and the communities that they serve. With that, I will introduce you to Mr. Felipe Ortiz, who is the current board chair of the LVCCLD. Mr. Ortiz. Good morning and thank you, Assemblywoman Shannon Bilberry Axelrod. Good morning, Chair Edgar Flores, Vice, Vice Chair Selena Torres, and members of the Government Affairs Committee. Uh, as stated, my name is Felipe Ortiz. I'm the current chair. I'm here on behalf of the Board of Trustees who voted to move both of these items forward for legislative uh, approval. Also with me is today is Executive Director Kelvin Watson, and we're both, both here and available to answer any questions. I'd like to say a few words to compliment uh, Shannon Bilberry Axelrod's uh, introduction. Uh, so first things first, we have 640,783 cardholders. We also have 508,975 program participants. We had 4,278,550, sorry, 50 branch visits. We currently have 18,071 programs operating. We have over 1,357,307 computer sessions, and we had over 19,182,741 items. As you can see, the library has grown over the years, and the, the challenges are unique to the library district. We're a top tier one library district. And the reason that we ask for both of these items is that um, as far as the trustee selecting a director, we want to expand the pool of applicants. Right now, by keeping it to an MLIS, it's limiting. That does not mean, let me repeat that, that does not mean that whoever selected, we are going to ask them to get an MLIS uh, degree. So in our view, it's better to expand the applicants and then ask them to go learn the tools of the trade because in library there's construction planning building and a lot of ancillary items that are critical that a lot of mlis individuals may not have had the experience of and so that's the first part we would ask for approval of that item it does not impact any library under with a population of a million or less so it's really us right now, the Las Vegas Clark County Library District, and then maybe Washoe County in the future. Secondly, I'm a fiscal conservative. And so one of the things is that our our library budget in 2018 was 91 million because of COVID, uh, the pandemic, it's now gone to 71 million. But I firmly believe that we're gonna go back to that amount of money. Uh, that's a lot of money. And so there's a lot of moving parts. We currently pay BDO, a big uh, accounting firm to do our overall audit that provides the information to us and then to the legislative council bureau and then the legislature and to the cities and the counties. And theirs is a financial audit. What we're looking is for an internal auditor that can do performance audits. Performance audits real quick. If you said you're gonna serve 200 people, did you serve 200 people? Uh, if you said you're gonna if, get 200,000 to do a program of A, did you spend the 200,000 on program A and not on program B? And so it does two things. One, it allows the board of trustees to uh, make sure and assure that the programs are being uh, complied with, completed. And it also allows the director to do a little bit, uh, to help the director do better long-term planning. And so those are the reasons that we've asked for the internal a performance audit person and for the expansion of the requirements of the library trust of the library director for libraries with a with a million or more people and so on behalf of the board of trustees we ask sorry i'm trying to read off two screens and it's difficult on behalf of the board of trustees we are asking this committee for approval of assembly bill 258 i or the executive director kevin watson would be happy to answer the questions 
thank you for your time and consideration of Assembly Bill 258. Thank you again to both of you and it's great having you both this morning. Um, with that members, we're gonna open it up to questions. And I am now going through our chat to see if anybody has messaged me. And we'll start off with Assemblywoman Anderson. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Assemblymember uh, Bill Bray Axelrod for bringing this forward. I always love hearing about libraries as a daughter and um, actually both my parents were librarians at one point or another in their life. So it's always fabulous to have an opportunity to celebrate our libraries. Um, there was a letter that was um, put in as an exhibit. So I just wanted to see, is this already something that is a possibility and it is just simply a solidifying it in law or has there been some changes over the last times as where this became a necessity? Mr. Ortiz, would you like to take that one? Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, through you. Basically, we already have the opportunity to do internal audits. That is done through a contract. And so any contract over 50,000 has to be put before the Board of Trustees for a vote, solicit the bid. And so it's very timely and time consuming. As you can see, there's a lot of departments that we have, a lot of moving parts. We would prefer the opportunity to continue to do that as an employee of the trustees. And it would uh, facilitate the process much faster. It would be continuous. It wouldn't take the employees by surprise. They know that the certain departments are gonna be audited so they can prepare for those audits as opposed to being uh, selecting uh, a, uh, an auditor that's out for bid and then they don't know who's gonna be audited. So it just facilitates it faster, makes it easier and uh, removes a lot of stress from the employees and the other departments that uh, will be in there for the audit. So I hope that answers your question. Very much. Thank you very much for that clarification. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Next, if we can go to Assemblywoman Thomas. Good morning, Chair, and thank you. And uh, thank you, Assemblywoman, for bringing uh, this bill forward. Um, I just have a couple of questions here. Um, in the bill, it appears to narrowly list um, qualifications for the uh, executive director um, obtaining an um, a, a MLIS. And as I was reading, I was wondering if we are narrowly um, looking at qualifications of an executive director and not considering um, those that have had um, um, uh, older degrees like an MLS and uh, MSLS. Um, so I, you know, that is basically my question. I just want to make sure that um, you're not narrowly um, uh, considering the qualifications of others that may um, be able to perform this duty. Um, Assemblywoman Shannon Bill Ray Oxrod for the record. Uh, I would say that the language being permissive actually expands that. Um, we do recognize that um, having a, a professional background in libraries is obviously helpful, but as we as we spoke about the size and scope of this job, it is really more like a CEO type position. Um, and so we while we we find that the MLS, the um, other degrees viable and helpful, we just really want to give the option to open up the field even more. And to that end, I, I would actually ask if our executive uh, director, Mr. Watson, would speak on his experience um, in the hiring. He's worked in several different uh, library districts, um, most recently in Florida, but he was in Queens before. So if you could just speak to that briefly, I would appreciate that, Mr. Watson. Good morning. Um, for the record, I am Executive Director Kelvin Watson. Um, so my experience, I have over 20 years of experience in both libraries and business. 
I have an undergraduate degree in business. I also was a, um, a former military officer as well. Um, I spent the first half of my career in business working for um, companies that sold materials to libraries, as well as I have retail experience. Um, I have IT experience, and then I have also worked in, in libraries. I do actually I have an a, uh, MLS, and I would say that um, the, the roles and responsibilities of leading large library systems that you that you would want to look at um, expanding the educational requirements and or the skills that uh, that an individual may have. And I'm also currently pursuing my MBA as well. So that's I hope I answered the question, but that's I, I think for this type of role, having the experience and the educational requirements, along with the opportunity to um, pursue the MLS, if you don't have an MLS or MLIS, that you would do that after you uh, took on this, took on this, a role such as this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Watson and uh, Chair, follow up, please. Please follow up. Uh, again, thank you, Mr. Watson, for your service and for that extensive uh, background. Um, it sounds like you would qualify for the position also. Um, um, the follow-up question actually is for um, Chair uh, Ortiz. Um, you mentioned that you want an internal auditor to perform uh, for each library, and I understand that. Um, I just want to know what's the qualifications for that internal uh, auditor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, thank you for the question. The uh, qualifications are they have to have a CPA, knowledge of general accounting, uh, government accounting practices. Uh, and clearly, we'd like them to understand uh, the process for which the state of Nevada and the Legislative uh, Council Bureau requires audits under the NRS. Um, that doesn't mean they have to have all of that, but they if they don't have it, they'll have to learn it. So CPA, uh, knowledge of the government uh, accounting practices, and hopefully knowledge of uh, how they submit audits to the legislature. Uh, because ultimately, we're creatures of the state, and so we need to be accountable to them. If they don't have that, they'll have to come up to speed very quickly. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir, it did. Thank you so much, and thank you, Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Uh, next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Dickman. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, um, Assemblywoman Wilbur Axelrod. Um, and Mr. Ortiz, thank you so much for your um, all the information about the library system in, in Clark County. I, it's amazing. I was very surprised at how big it is. But I also like the fact that you're a fiscal conservative and that you um, care about making sure that the money is spent where, it, where it's supposed to be. But I was just curious, I don't see a fiscal note, so would this um, position be paid for out of your budget? Um, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axrod, for the record, um, that is correct, but uh, Mr. Ortiz, you can confirm that as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, through you, uh, Assemblywoman. Uh, just real quick, I am a fiscal conservative. In my past life, I was a federal probation and parole officer. And uh, we saw too many cases of government employees taking government money. The record is clear. It's, I don't need to even go into that. And so that doesn't mean that's happening here. It's important that we know that our services are being uh, performed as, as committed to and that the money is spent accordingly. Two plus two always equals four. And so the final answer is yes, the money is coming out of the Clark County Library District budget. Right now, we're only permitted one employee. That's the director. We're asking for permission to hire a second employee at a much lower rate, of course. I'm sorry. Sorry, accountants. I hope that answers your question. It does, and I think it's great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Next, we'll go to Madam Vice Chair. 
Sorry, I clearly was not uh, <laughs> not ready to press the unmute button there. Um, thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Um, and I really do appreciate this legislation. Um, I think libraries are an integral part of our community. Um, and I think that it helps to get our students where they need to be um, when we're looking at the education system, but that they're also playing a positive role um, in, for other Nevadans as well. So I just wanna understand a little bit more about why um, this pop cap is put into place. Uh, this seems really reasonable for all libraries. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering it, why it's only applicable to this type of library. Uh, Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray Axrod for the record. As I mentioned in my early testimony, we are the 11th largest library district in the nation. And so with that, we have very um, unique uh, issues that happen. And like I said, you, we kind of have to run our uh, library board sort of more like a, a business, like a, it's a CEO type uh, role. Other library districts are not that large. Um, it's, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Di Executive Director Watson uh, worked in Queens. Um, I, you can say how many libraries are in that. It, this is just a very, very large library system, and you don't typically see that. We are literally on the likes of with Los Angeles, Chicago, um, just very, very large. So that's that's why we thought it was important. And, um, and you know, uh, Chair Ortiz mentioned that at some point Washoe might get there. I think that's gonna be a long time coming, but um, the language is also permissive, right? So if we got to the point where they, they wanted to, we could always come back to the legislature, but this is really just an issue for the Las Vegas Clark County Library District. And Chair, follow up for me. Follow up, please. Uh, and, I, and I appreciate that. And I think it's because the language is permissive that I'm wondering if it doesn't make more sense that we do that now so that as these districts, as, a, as these library districts um, want to have these opportunities, um, that they would be able to do so and we wouldn't have to revisit this legislation. Did they ask not to be included in this, in this specific legislation? Um, or was that not a conversation that we had with them? Like, I'm just wondering, because since it is permissive. Thank you, Assemblyman Torres, Assemblyman Bill Braxford, for the record. Um, there were definitely uh, conversations that were had and kind of how we got down to um, the Nevada Library Association sort of being neutral on it was that it was just going to be Las Vegas Clark County Library District. Great. Follow up, Madam Vice Chair, or are we good? We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Assemblyman Ellison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have a small question. Uh, in the bill, it says it consolidates the, the city into the county library district. At that point in time, does the does the county still utilize all the city's employees that are there uh, or did the county take control? How does that how does that function or operate? You're moving it into a, a different district, but is it still controlled by the city? Uh, thank you, Assemblyman Ellison, for the record, Shannon, Assemblywoman Shannon Bill Braxrod. We are um, the Las Vegas Clark County Library District. So our board of trustees are made up of board members who were appointed by both county commission and uh, city councilmen. So we are currently both the Las Vegas Clark County and Clark County Library District. Um, I don't know if, if, if Chair Ortiz wants to. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman, through you. Uh, Assemblyman, the legislature allowed the combination of a lot of combinations of districts to be regional or consolidated. Years ago, Las Vegas was much bigger, uh, had a larger population than Clark County, so they voted to consolidate. That was a good news. The other good news, they said, you can be your own taxing authority, but if you go under, it's your own money. So there's no employees attached to either Las Vegas uh, City or Clark County. So the Las Vegas Clark County Library District is its own taxing authority. And so we became 
a consolidated district and I want to say it's uh, might have been 89 or 92 I'm not sure at this point but I 92 sounds like it, it clings to my mind and so they created a consolidated district allowed us to do a uh, for populations over uh, a certain amount I want to say it was 600,000 at the time if you read the NRS and then they allowed us to be our own taxing district so basically we raise our own money through roof tax, consolidated sea tax, and then uh, we have to have a capital reserves fund to make sure our employees are paid at the end of the year in case we go under. We have to uh, project income to, and submit that to the legislature every year. So as you can see, it runs like a small city, if you will. And that's why the need to have a CEO type individual with knowledge of libraries and also the need to have um, a performance auditor with us so that we can move forward because I suspect there's more houses being built in Clark County. We're going to get larger. So I hope that answers your question. And uh, if I may, I, I should have actually said as uh, something about Shannon Bilbert Axelrod for the record, we are actually what is considered a special district um, is the terminology used. Yeah, and thank you. Uh, because I, I I totally agree. Because uh, like the city of Elko, the library is owned by the county, or operated by the county, but the it is a tax district of own on the ad valorem. So I understand that. I just didn't know if if this would be a change or if something that's already in place. So it looks like it is. So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Assemblyman. Members. I don't know that we have any other questions. I'm looking at the chat now. I'll come back to Assemblywoman Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that information. I, I think um, I don't know if it's more of a question or a comment because I think uh, the, this legislation clearly shows that there are some different areas when it comes to the library districts, and so. Um, and then with assembly member Ellison's questions, it kind of makes you us wonder how many of our library districts are kind of not under the purview of the county and everything. That's not germane to this bill, but I wanted to put that on the record that possibly with maybe our, our legislative training or something that maybe next time we just have to start thinking about how our libraries are, where are they? Are they under our county commission? Are they under the city? How exactly are they funded? Because it sounds like Clark County is funded in a very specific fashion due to the size that they are, but it might be different in Washington and it might be different in Karsten and, and it's an important element for us just to be aware of. So I just wanted to add that into our comments if possible. But thank you, no need to reply unless you really wish to. Thank you. Members, any additional questions? I don't believe I see any additional questions. If if I accidentally skipped you, please free, feel free now to unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Seeing none, um, thank you again both for your presentation. At this time, I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in support of Assembly Bill 258. Broadcast, if you could please go to the phone line. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 258, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite those wishing to testify in opposition to Assembly Bill 258. To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 258, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. And Lastly, I'd like to invite those wishing to speak in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 258. To speak in neutral for Assembly Bill 258, 
please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 377. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Todd Colgrove, C-O-L-E-G-R-O-V-E, -E, President of the Nevada Library Association, for the record. Thank you, Chair Flores, members of the Assembly, Education Chair Bill Reacts, and Chair Ortiz and Director Watson of the LBCCLD. My testimony on behalf of the Nevada Library Association is already part of the record. I would add on a personal note that as a, as a former administrator of the Nevada State Library Age Archives and Public Records, I am deeply familiar with the way that Chapter 379 of the NRS and the Administrative Code speak to this question in particular. Minimum public library standards play a critical role in meeting the requirements of federal code to ensure access to substantial federal monies that come into the state each year. In the letter from the uh, Nevada Library Association, I addressed uh, that it would seem that the proposed amendment for uh, opening up the uh, qualifications of the of the director is unnecessary because it's already contemplated and it's something that the legislature uh, has already moved in the past and written into the code and uh, that, that specifically enables it so that any board uh, each board of, of libraries around the state whether they're in a separate district or in uh, a municipality or a county is already authorized to hire someone with or without the credentials of Masters of Library Science. The system that the legislature has already put in place is one in which the state library, the administrator of the state library agency, in conjunction with uh, Nevada Revised Statutes Chapter 379 and the Administrative Code, is able to is able to issue a, a waiver to the, the, the library itself on a year-by-year -year basis to encourage the board and the library to get that director up to speed in terms of their credentialing as far as the library is concerned. If they never do achieve that credentialing, the only way that that would impact uh, is should the admin uh, state library agency decide that the waiver is no longer appropriate and need to uh, revoke that, meaning that the district would no longer have access to the federal money. Again, the reason why the minimum public library standards are put in place is to ensure that the state has access to those millions of dollars each year. Thank you for your consideration in this matter. And thank you for joining us this morning. I'll continue with those wishing to testify in the neutral position on Assembly Bill 258. Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Great. Um, so at this time, we'll go ahead and come back to Assemblywoman Bill Bree Axelrod and Mr. Ortiz uh, for any closing remarks and or if there's any interest in addressing uh, anything that was said during our neutral testimony. Um, well, I was actually, Assemblywoman Shannon Bilbray Axrod, for the record, I, I did want to um, address Assemblywoman Anderson's uh, question. I, I, I cannot speak for absolute certainty, but I believe that Las Vegas Clark County Library District is the only special district in the state. Um, I think every other library is either run by the city or the county, but don't 100% quote me on that. I'm just, I'm about 90% sure. Um, the waiver is not the same as a board power to hire to speak to the, the neutral testimony. So this is really just 
you know, we, we just really need to set this out in NRS and NAC. And I think this is the vehicle to do it just so there's not, it's on the record, it's clear. Um, and we are able to establish those educational requirements. So um, with that, I will um, say thank you very much for your consideration, unless uh, Chair Ortiz had something else to finish. Otherwise we, oh, he is, looks like he's unmuting. Thank you, Shannon Bilbrey Axelrod, Assemblywoman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and all the rest of the Assembly. We would invite you and encourage you to vote for this bill. Uh, we believe it's life has changed, technology's changed, uh, the pandemic has changed us all, and this really moves us, continues to move us forward for at least another 10 years. I'm sure we'll have another change between now and then, but at least this resolves a lot of issues. Thank you again, and I invite you to support this bill and vote for this bill. Thank you. And thank you both uh, for your presentation this morning and joining us. I'm sure members will continue to reach out if they have any questions, as we always encourage them to do so. Uh, at this time, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on Assembly Bill 258. And at this time, I'd like to uh, invite those wishing to join us for public comment to please do so. As always, I want to remind you that public comment is not a time for us to reopen a hearing or entertain debate on a previously heard uh, bill. This is a time for you to speak about general matters that fall within the purview of this committee. We want to encourage you to participate. I just uh, uh, want to make sure that you know that this is not a time for us to reopen this hearing that we just had now or anything like that. Um, with that broadcast, if you could please go to those wishing to speak in public comment. To take place in public comment, please press star nine now. Caller with the last three digits of 072. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good day. My name is Valerie Frisky, V A L E R I E F R I S K E Y. I'm a resident of Assembly District 39. I retired after teaching for 45 years in Nevada, and I'm active in the Nevada State Education Association, retired. I'm here to encourage you to consider the need for all education employees across the state to have access to quality, affordable health care upon retirement. Our members are facing escalating costs of health care and prescriptions. Please keep in mind that Nevada is a WEP GPO state, and many of our retired members won't have access to affordable health care because they won't and don't qualify for Social Security and Medicare. Currently, as my colleagues retire, they face insurance costs from $800 to $1,000 a month and more after spending their entire career as public school employees. Working together, I hope we can solve this problem. Thank you for your time. And thank you for joining us this morning. We'll continue with those wishing to uh, speak during public comment. Next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 556, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Anne Marie Grant, A-N-N-E-M-A-R-I-E-G-R-A-N-T. My brother Thomas Purdy was killed by Reno Police and Washoe County Sheriff's Office, asphyxiated on 10-4-2015, and we removed him from life support on 10-8-2015 as he was brain dead. Today I want to talk about Eric Scott. On 7-10-2010, Eric Scott was shot leaving the Costco's in Las Vegas by LVMPD officer William Mosher, who fired two rounds in Joshua Stark. And Thomas Mendiola, who also fired, hitting Eric seven times. Literally, a Costco loss prevention supervisor claimed Eric had a gun in his waistband and Costco prohibits weapons. Literally said that Eric did not threaten anyone inside the store, didn't act violently, and didn't remove the gun from his waistband. A handgun was later found still in its holster. Mosher testified he didn't recall ordering Eric, who is now outside the store, and would have been within his constitutional rights according to your state Second Amendment laws to drop the gun. But a 911 recording 
recorded that that command was given to Eric by Marsha. In truth, Eric was leisurely walking out of Costco that day. He wasn't posing a threat to anybody. He didn't make any aggressive movements. In fact, Marsha instructed Eric to drop the gun. Eric was surrounded by three officers. He turned around. He was compliant. He was told to drop the gun, and he did exactly that and was executed for it. Eric was the second community member killed by Marsha. Eric Scott like my brother, Thomas, was 38 years old, and I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Eric as a human being. All these loved ones I speak of are not just words flowing from my mouth, but people who are loved and missed immensely. Eric was a veteran who attended the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, graduated in the top 10% of his class, was commissioned as a U.S. Army officer in May of 1994. He subsequently served as an M1A1 tank platoon leader with the 1st Cavalry. He left active duty during the post military drawdown and embarked on a successful career in medical and real estate fields and was transferred to Las Vegas in 1999. While working full-time, he obtained a master's degree in business administration from Duke Business School, then branched into real estate. Eric was the sales director and involved in a major project in Las Vegas. He is loved and missed by his parents, Bill and Linda Scott, and his brother, Kevin Scott, and so many others. Thank you. And thank you for joining us this morning. If we can continue with those wishing to testify in public comment, please. Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no more callers at this time. Thank you. Uh, members, I wanna remind you that uh, this upcoming uh, Monday, we are not meeting at 10, we're starting at 9 a.m. Just want to make sure that that's abundantly clear. Um, for those of you that have travel arrangements, I want to make sure that you're here on time. We'll be starting at 9 a.m. And uh, as you've all seen uh, on floor, we've had a whole host of bills drop, um, which means that we have a very limited amount of time to hear a lot of bills. Um, you know, at this point, we're looking at a minimum of two to three bills per day, um, every day until uh, first uh, house passage. I make that note only because we'll likely uh, very soon have to switch over to an 8 a.m. start time as we have to fulfill uh, our duties and, and, and give an opportunity to those bills be vetted. So uh, for now, we'll, we'll try to stay on the 9 a.m. Uh, start time as, as much as we can. I, I understand that people appreciate that little bit of extra hour of sleep, uh, but we may have to change that very soon. Just wanted to put that in your purview. Um, on Monday, we'll be hearing Assembly Bill 187. Give yourself an opportunity to read that bill over the weekend, become familiar with it, and we'll have our very own Speaker of the House presenting it, and we look forward to having him. With that, members, I appreciate this week. We put in some good work. We have some great dialogue, and I expect for that to continue next week. Appreciate the work. Uh, thank you to our staff, as always, for all their hard work, and with that, this meeting's adjourned.